Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. We well, you know over the last couple of years, we've seen increasing clashes between parents and public school officials. There's a call for greater clarity in the role of parents' involvement in the education of their children. But joining me in for a conversation about parental rights and education is Michael Ramey, president of the Parental Rights Foundation. And thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Bob. Well, you know, in preparing for our conversation, one thing that the experts agree on that actually children have better outcomes if parents are involved in terms of their education. And so um, there seems to be no dispute about that, correct? No, that's that's true. We've known that for a while now. <laughs> yes. Well, tell us about the uh, Parental Rights Foundation. What is uh, your mission and, 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 uh, and, and purpose activities? What's some of the things you do? Sure. Well, our heartbeat is protecting children by empowering parents. Uh, that's the bottom line for us. And uh, we started off as parentalrights.org in 2007. That's a, uh, a C4 sort of politically active organization. Uh, we started the foundation in 2014 as a C3, really a policy and education organization to, uh, to work out policies and educate both the public and lawmakers uh, on what's good in terms of parental rights. Um, again, protecting children by empowering parents. And among your various activities, uh, policy research and what have you, and advocating solutions, but you also do some legal work in, from time to time, true? We do. Uh, we're not a law firm and we don't have lawyers on staff, but we do have lawyers on our board. Uh, our former president was a lawyer. And so we've been able to weigh in largely through amicus briefs on important parental rights uh, uh, court cases uh, around the country. Well, you know, um, back when I was uh, growing up and then also in terms of with my boys, there were these PTAs, Parent Teachers Associations, and they were quite strong in terms of fundraising and different activities. Uh, are, is that even still existing today in most schools? I, I believe they do still exist in some places, but it's not as universal as it once was. And I think they've greatly been weakened, too, uh, to become more a service arm of the, the teachers than uh, then really an opportunity for parents to speak up and and be a part of shaping, uh, you know, the policy decisions in the school. So, um, yeah, what we've really been seeing in the last three or four years, uh, since COVID sent all the kids home and parents saw what's going on in the classrooms and a lot that they weren't happy with, uh, we've seen a rise in new parent organizations, um, Moms for Liberty, Parents Defending Education, and some others that um, that are standing up and parents coming together to speak out and make their voices heard. And we know that we've seen that increase uh, in Commonwealth Virginia. And of course, it was part of the Governor Youngkin's uh, came an issue during the gubernatorial campaign and still that he talks about. But this is true nationwide, isn't it? I mean, it really is a national reattention uh, to parents' rights and also related to education. It, it really is. Um, and not just parents' rights, but parents exercising their First Amendment rights uh, to speak into the culture and curriculum at their schools. Well, you know, um, do you think um, some of these activities uh, are, are political or too political? In other words, it seems like it's portrayed some in the media that if you are concerned or if you go and express yourself, that's, quote, Republican. But really, um, parental rights and involvement shouldn't really be political, should it? Well, I think the word you're looking for is partisan, actually, um, ah. because really, by definition, it sort of is political. It's it's weighing in on the policies that we're going to adopt. Um, and that's something that's we've not seen a lot of in the last couple of decades. It's like we leave it to the experts. We let the schools decide what they're going to teach. And, you know, nobody's really debating it. Uh, we might be complaining about it, but we're not really doing anything about it. Um, and so parents are getting back into the politics of it and being heard. But you, but as far as um, partisan, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Um, it's it really is treated like it's some sort of a Republican issue or a conservative issue. And our organization is bipartisan. And um, more of our supporters uh, through our online uh, our existence, um, through our, our social media and so forth, uh, more of them tend to vote Democrat than Republican, which, you know, may surprise some people, but um, it, it's, it is a bipartisan issue. Well, um, has there been an erosion of parental rights? If so, how did that happen? I mean, I guess the magic moment in some ways, uh, our pivotal moment was COVID. Is, uh, did, 
re-energize some of the concerns, I guess. Re yes. Um, well, COVID re-energized, but I really think it's sort of like uh, that turned the light on. Uh, the problems were already taking place. Uh, parents were already being kept out of the equation. They just didn't realize how bad things were getting without them in there. Um, and so, uh, you know, the COVID really did shine a light on it. Parents began to see into their child's classroom and think, wait a second, this is what my child is learning. I thought they were learning reading and writing and um, and arithmetic and, uh, you know, history and those things. And instead, they're learning all these things that parents, th that's not why they sent their kids to school in the first place. Um, so, so that really shone the light on it. And parents said, oh, wait, now I see. So the problems were already going on. And there already was, um, you know, sort of this trust the experts. Uh, the schools know what they're doing. The administrators know what they're doing. Um, but now we realize that, well, OK, maybe they know what they're doing, but it's not what I want them to be doing. Well, what are some of the, um, and we'll get to some specifics um, and, and just a little bit, but what are some of the major area of concerns that you have that you think are immediate? Well, I know we're talking education today, uh, and I do want to focus a lot, uh, almost everything on that, but just I'll take this opportunity to mention um, health care, um, child welfare investigations that that burst into the homes of innocent families because they're poor and they're struggling to make ends meet. Um, there are parental rights threats all across the spectrum. But it, uh, here today, we're talking education. And one of the biggest things that's just really exploded in recent weeks uh, is is this idea of schools keeping secrets from parents about the health and well-being of their minor children, uh, particularly if a child says that they're transgender or they're uh, interested in, um, you know, if they're homosexual or, or whatever it might be, if they're a non-binary or some minority uh, in the sexual or, or gender uh, area, then the schools want to keep that a secret from parents, which of course violates the parents' fundamental right to direct the upbringing, education, and care of their children. Because how can you direct those things if you don't know what's going on? And, you know, it seems like there's two sides, or not two sides, but two aspects of this. One is, um, am I being informed? Mm -hmm. Do I know what I need to know? And the other side is, are there opportunities for them to solicit my opinion, for me to be able to look at the budget and things like that. And it seems like there are two dynamics um, when you're talking about parental rights related to the schools. Yeah, there are. And and I think we're, um, we're seeing sort of the pendulum swing back uh, where for a while parents were just trusting and not really looking into things. Uh, and now parents are interested in looking into things that even when I was in school, um, you know, and my parents were responsible and looked into things, but they didn't look into everything. Um, and right now, parents are realizing, wait, we've got a mess here. We want to look into everything. Um, and I really can't say that I blame them. Well, let, let me uh, ask a, a few examples. I mean, so do you think parents um, should have a voice in terms of academic curriculum that is taught? Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, um, you know, that's not a parental rights question per se. Uh, my parental rights sh are shaped around my child. Um, you know, can I opt if I don't like the curriculum that's being taught? I, can I opt my child out of it? That's my parental rights. Um, but uh, what we are talking about are First Amendment rights, the freedom of speech, uh, the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition their government for a redress of grievances. And that's really what parents are doing at these school board meetings. Um, and through their lawmakers too, and weighing in on what the curriculum should be, uh, what should be in the in the libraries and in the classrooms. And um, you know, the other side has has not been used to parents doing that. Uh, but parents absolutely I mean, the parents are ultimately responsible for raising their children, for educating their children. And so they should be exercising their par parental rights when it comes to their child. And they should be weighing in on the overall curriculum and so forth of, of the entire school to, to the degree that they legally can do so. And the First Amendment protects their right to do that. Well, and we hear that, um, as you referenced earlier, that the professionals say we are the professionals. Mm -hmm. We have pedagogy. We have uh, degrees uh, in education. We actually know better. Um, and they expect more deference. But it seems as if one can, as you say, in terms of freedom, be able to express some concerns, whether it's books in the library or, or what have you. 
Yes, there there are two things uh, really to consider there. Um, one is that okay, they have put in the hours and and gone through the schooling and so forth, um, and and so they're experts perhaps on education. They might be experts on child development. Um, there's this theory that it takes roughly ten thousand hours in a thing to become an expert on it, and so through their college and through their years of teaching experience or administration and so forth, they have gained that experience. But when it comes to your child. You put in 10,000 hours on your child by the time they reach the age of five. And so you are the expert on your child. And they, if your child were set to sit under the same teacher for six hours a day, 180 uh, classroom days a year for all 12 grades, they still wouldn't reach the level uh, of expertise of your child and time spent with your child that you had by the time they turned six. So you're the expert on your child. But the second thing we have to consider here is, OK, even if they are the experts, they also are the government. We live in a nation by we that we the people uh, established uh, through our constitution that is supposed to limit the government. And yes, they are they may be education experts, but they're funded by the government. They're paid by the government. I'm, I'm talking public school teachers here, obviously not private schools and so forth. But all of the public schools ultimately are funded by the government, and so all of these uh, experts are government funded experts. And we as a free people can't afford to just trust the government um, and saying just trust the experts in this case is is synonymous with saying just trust the government. And we can't afford to do that. Well, and I guess another big a lot of concerns about what, quote, indoctrination, the political biases or personal biases that individual teachers have. But that's a hard thing to try to to at least manage isn't it. I mean, to know Um what goes on, but I guess it's reflected within the curriculum itself. Yeah, it really is. And that's kind of the bigger thing. Um, an individual teacher here or there who has a particular bias, uh, that's kind of always going to be the case because, you know, teachers are individuals too, and they're human. And um, and we all have our own viewpoints and our own biases. Uh, but when the whole curriculum or the whole structure is around one particular um, really one uh, doctrine, in a sense, one orthodoxy uh, that they're allowed to push, that they're allowed to teach, and they're going to push it in every classroom, um, you know, then then it's gone too far. Then you have to wonder, are we really kind of establishing a, a religion here, or at least a belief system uh, that everyone is supposed to, to uh, buy into? Well, so let's say that I have a concern. Mm -hmm. You want to go about in a proper way as a parent, what what are the process that you would recommend? Would you go to a teacher first? Would you go to the principal, the school board? In other words, what is the responsibility of a parent to at least um, if they have a concern and to approach it? Sure. Well, um, I mean, I would start with your, your teacher. Um, you know, ultimately, um, and when I was a kid, you know, we were concerned maybe at the federal level and sometimes at the state level, but our local school still was part of our community. Um, our teachers do care about our kids by and large. Uh, and so you start with the teacher, you start with the administrator or the librarian or wherever your point of um, of concern is. Um, and you, you go up the ladder as you have to, um, but try to work as a team just because it's most effective. Um, uh, you know, I'm not saying that uh, that you're an equal partner with them. Certainly not. You're the one ultimately responsible for the education of your child. But if you can go to the teacher and say, hey, look, I have a concern with this. What can we do about it? Uh, that's just good diplomacy and, and likely to be the most effective. But if you have to go all the way up to the point where you're banding together with hundreds of other parents to go to a school board meeting and demand that you be heard, then you do that too. Um, just maybe not start there, but it, but a lot of folks are in a situation they've already tried the other and that's where they found themselves. And in which case I say, you know, keep going and make your voice heard for the sake of your children. Well, what are some in terms of best practices? How can schools and districts improve in trying to have responsible parent involvement, what have you? What are some of the things that you would say is best practices that certain schools and districts should be doing that they're not doing? Well, um, that, that's a really good question. It's kind of outside my area of expertise. I do re recognize that, um, you know, there's a lot of technology. I mean, technology has come a long way in the last 10, 20 years, um, in the last six months in some ways. Um, and so parents need to avail themselves to that. And schools 
school systems need to be using that as well. You know, up-to-date websites, um, social media presence, uh, email lists, ways to contact parents and let them know what's going on in a timely fashion. Uh, you know, they can do that for school days. They can do that for other things that come up in the schools as well. And they, they should take advantage of that technology, I would, I would say. And you would think that there might be some, I guess there are public hearings related to budget and, and various things like that. And so part of the responsibility is knowing where the key points are that you can have input at uh, specific times across a budget year or what have you. Right. Yes. And um, budget is something I really don't know much about in terms of uh, in terms of education. But uh, but I do appreciate that so many parents across the country who do understand budgets and understand all these other things uh, are getting involved and are asking the questions and demanding the answers and then weighing in on, well, this this shouldn't be like this. We can make this better. So that's that's really what's going to provide the best outcome for children is getting the parents involved and letting them speak. Um, what is the role, um, cause we, it seems to be confusing in a way, but what is the role for state and federal legislatures as it relates to, uh, protecting parental rights? Um, and also in terms of some of the things that come down in terms of schools, whether it's sports or what have you, is there sure. a role well, for them to play? Th yeah, there absolutely is. As we mentioned before, I mean, a lot of the the, this at the macro level, not at the my child level, but at the our children level, at the our school level, a lot of that is a political question, a policy question, and lawmakers should weigh in on that. A number of states have passed laws recently uh, to change curriculum or to uh, limit the things that the schools can or can't do, um, that sort of thing. And, and that's a role for them to play. And they need to be listening to the parents and the communities and what they want and not just professional organizations uh, and teachers unions and so forth that have a single voice. But listen to the communities, listen to the parents, um, because they really have the inter the best interest of their child at heart. I mean, nature compels parents to act in the best interest of their child. Uh, but another thing that they can do uh, that our organization is really supportive of is passing laws that just establish that parental rights are fundamental and that they're not to be infringed on without meeting the highest form of judicial scrutiny, which is strict judicial scrutiny. Um, and, and I would love to see also us pass a parental rights amendment to the U.S. Constitution establishing uh, these long-held traditional fundamental rights of parents uh, right there in the black and white of the constitutional text. Well, you know, um, I guess we have a lot of controversy about, they want to call it book banning, um, but it seems to me most of it could be, well, at least let there be age appropriateness uh, to some of the material and not just general access. Public libraries are kind of different animals, I guess, than public school libraries. Do you see a distinction there? And should uh, parents have a voice there about the collections in the public school libraries? Absolutely. If they're sending their children there, then they should be able to weigh in. Now, that doesn't mean that a single parent can have a book removed because it would have been their single child. But it does mean that the parents collectively should weigh in. Uh, and if they say this book's not appropriate to our community, to our to our to our children uh, at this age group, um, then then they should be listened to. They should exercise their their constitutional right, their constitutional voice. Um, and they should be listened to. And you're right. You know, opponents of this are calling it book banning. But when the book is banned, you can't publish it. You can't read it. You can't possess it. You can't buy it at the bookstore. And you won't find it in the library. The only one of those things that anybody's talking about is you won't find it in the elementary school library. You can buy it. You can publish it. Uh, you know, if you want it, go to the bookstore. It's not banned. Uh, but parents should have a say. Not every book is appropriate. Uh, in an edu in an elementary school library. Um, when um, how does Virginia compare to other states when you're looking at legislation and and kind of parental rights? How does Virginia stack up? Um, pretty well. They in in 2013, Virginia passed a law that establishes in the black and white of of the Virginia Code that parental rights are fundamental. Um, and that's a, a good solid backstop for a lot of times when the government might choose to overreach. Uh, we can point to that law and say, wait a second, our rights are fundamental. The state has recognized that and you need to honor it. Um, but on the other hand, there are some states who've done a little bit better um, because some states have a detailed parents bill of rights. Uh, Florida, Georgia, Oklahoma all come to mind uh, where they take that same premise that parental rights are fundamental. Uh, but then they also spell that out. And what that looks like in the day-to-day -day practice of, of uh, 
the schools, um, the you know medical practices, um, child welfare, and those kinds of things. And so, um, I, you know, I like those a little bit better. Virginia could could add some teeth and uh, and add some detail, and that would be great. But they are they are one of about nineteen states nationwide who recognize parental rights uh, as as fundamental rights in their code. So in that sense, they're doing well. Well, you know, if we talk about um, um, community standards, in your philosophical perspective, there could be perhaps in a district, four different schools. Is it possible perhaps, depending upon those individual schools could differ as to certain policies or what have you? reflective of the community standards or values? Can it even be that um, detailed, I guess I'm asking? Well, in times past, it could have been uh, decades ago, but the forming of the uh, Department of Education at the federal level back in the 70s uh, really has kind of uh, ended a lot of that, uh, made it for a lot more cookie cutter. So now where you see the, the differences might be from one school district to another, um, now, there are some minor things, perhaps, where one school's policy will differ, perhaps a behavior policy or something like that. Um, but the the bigger the bigger the policy is, the the higher up the decision was made about it, uh, all the way up to the Department of Education. And I, I'm not really sure that that's uh, that that's served us well as a country. Well, you know, not to make something too terribly political, but when you're hearing more and more discussion about at the point where we are now, uh, and if one really wants to have that kind of parental involvement, the alternatives have to be things like the private schools and charter schools. Uh, um, and yet there's financial burdens there. Do you see that, uh, do you happen to think that the money should follow uh, the child? Now we're at a point where you should have school choice, genuinely so? So the Parental Rights Foundation holds very solidly that parents should have the right to choose. Uh, there should be pr uh, parental choice in education as far as whether it's a, a private school, a, a parochial school, even homeschooling, uh, which has really taken off in the last three or four years mm -hmm. um, since the COVID uh, epidemic. Um, but but we as an organization have not taken a side on the money question because that's really just a political uh, hot, hot potato mm -hmm. Uh, that would divide folks who agree on parental rights, uh, but may not be in agreement on that. And I can see good, solid reasons on both sides. I mean, on the one side, uh, there are a lot of uh, poor families who can't really afford to put their child in private school, can't afford um, the time to homeschool because they have to work two minimum wage jobs or three uh, to make ends meet. And there are, there are challenges for them, and it would really help them if we say the money follows the child. Um, on the other hand, there are folks who fear that if the government gives money, the government also attaches strings. And the only reason they say that is because they know history and that's the way it's always been. Uh, so I can see the concerns on both sides. And we're kind of staying out of that official debate, um, but fully respect people with both opinions on that. Uh, absolutely agree that parents should get to choose. Well, we're down to a couple of minutes or so. And so I want to provide an opportunity. What are your final thoughts? What would you share? and the final couple of minutes that we have. I would encourage parents to keep uh, getting involved. Don't just put your kids on the bus and then forget about it for the day. Uh, you are responsible for their education. Uh, and you, uh, the more involved you are, the better the outcomes for your child, the better the outcomes for the children in your community. So exercise your parental rights as it pertains to your child. And then get together with other parents and exercise your political rights, uh, your First Amendment rights, to make your voice heard in your community and in your schools. Well, certainly it's been a, a great deal of uh, uh, gaining awareness in terms of parental rights and certainly related to schools. And I guess in some ways it's a shame that it took the, the uh, COVID and post-COVID to reactivate, but it's certainly very important. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us, and that is all the time we have. And I also want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.